Our uh, final speaker today is Suchi Saria. Um, she is Assistant Professor of Computer Science um, at Johns Hopkins University, and she has uh, joint appointments in both the Statistics Department and the Health Policy Department. So um, we've saved a topic of uh, special interest, I dare say, in uh, this audience, um, namely, what are these machines going to do to keep us alive? Excellent. That was such a fun talk. Thank you so much, Manuela. Uh, so my talk is going to switch context and not talk about robots, but humans. Um, let me just quickly plug in my clicker so I can actually move around. Um, uh oh. There you go. So this is joint work. Uh, in particular, I want to highlight my postdoc, Hussein Soleimani and Katie Henry. So I want to start with a little example, a concrete case study. Let me introduce you to Mrs. Barbara Manny. She's 52 years old. She came to the ED at one of the Hopkins hospitals. When she came in, she had what looked like dry gangrene in her foot. Also, she had pain and aches in her foot. She wasn't feeling generally well, and she didn't have great family social support. So they decided to admit her, and they admitted her to a general ward. On day three, she starts uh, experiencing what looks like symptoms of pneumonia. Uh, they, give her, they do the usual checkup, they give her the uh, usual treatment of antibiotics, and they continue to monitor her. On day six, she experiences tachycardia. In non-medical speak, that means her heart starts to accelerate dramatically. And on day seven, she experiences septic shock. Incidentally, death rate for patients with septic shock is one in two. Now at this point, the doctors, it's only at this point the doctors get really get worried and they transfer her to the intensive care unit. Um, here in the intensive care unit, they do everything possible to stabilize her. But unfortunately, first her kidneys started to fail, then her lungs failed, and on day 22, she died. So I brought up this case study because it's a very interesting example of someone where they did receive the right treatment. They, in fact, went to one of the premier medical institutions in the country. And they did receive all the right treatment for some of the best doctors. But the problem is they received these treatments too late. What happened to Mrs. Barbara Manny, what she experienced is uh, this problem, complication, or syndrome called sepsis. So let me tell you at a very high level what sepsis is. When you have an infection, your body releases chemicals to fight the infection. Now sometimes this response can go awry and it starts attacking your organ systems itself. If the attack is large enough, it causes your organ systems to fail and you die. Incidentally, uh, sepsis is the 11th leading cause of death more than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. And turns out sepsis is treatable or, or if uh, preventable um, if treated early. Now, so if that's the case, then what's the problem? The problem is that our ability to diagnose and recognize sepsis early is really bad. In fact, there are many studies that show this, including a study out of Harvard with 93 leading academics, where they show that when they present Experts with cases of patients with and without sepsis, the inter-expert agreement is very low. So one big revolution that has happened in medicine in the last uh, six to seven years is the introduction of what's called electronic health records. Here, every piece of measurement that is taken when you visit the clinic, when you go to the hospital, or any routine interaction with the health system gets stored. So let me tell you some examples of what kinds of data exist there. This is an example of sort of data that comes out of monitors. These are uh, monitors that, you know, they put sensors on your body. They capture high density, high frequency vital sign data, like heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, and so on and so forth, okay? In addition to these, you have measurements like these lab tests. Now, 
the lab, there are over a thousand lab tests, over a hundred that are frequently done in the unit. And these lab tests are often collected at either a regular schedule or upon discretion of the clinic. In statistical terms, you might call some of these missing at random. No, not missing completely at random, but missing at random. And so one thing to note here is this basically, this data, as I'm sort of presenting to you at the back of your mind, what you should also be thinking about is that data is really cruddy. For example, you know, some measurements are taken, none of these measurements are taken on a grid. They're sparse and irregularly sampled. Some are taken very frequently and some not so frequently at all. And if I layer some of the physio physiologic data on top of that, you can see that these sampling frequencies are really different. Um, more generally, these measurements can be extremely noisy. Now, beyond me uh, these numerical measures, we also have information about what treatments were given and when were they given, right? And that also contains a lot of information in terms of how they interleave with the measurements that are being collected. We also have notes that capture the doctors and the physician's perception of what's going on, the nurse's perception of what's going on. So it's particular symptoms they might be experiencing, changes in conditions that have taken place. So what I'm really painting for you here is this notion of uh, sort of a new world, really, where there's all this dense, dynamic data. This is a term I'm taking from Leroy Hood. He was one of the uh, uh, he was one of the winners of the awards yesterday. I don't know if Lee is here in the audience, but I love this term. Basically, this notion of a dense, dynamic data cloud that follows every individual as they're moving through our health system. And what that really allows us to do now is to think and look through disease in far more detail. Now, this is not the kind of data you would get in a lab setting where you could control your experiments, but these are really messy, dirty, uh, filled with bias uh, data. But the question is, can we still use them? Are they good for anything at all? And the exciting thing is, we don't just get data from one individual. We get data from thousands of individuals for our experiments. And eventually, really, as these uh, electronic health records get connected, will get data from millions and billions of individuals. So going forward for the rest of the talk, I'm going to describe the system I'm uh, going to refer to it as TRUES, or the Targeted Real-Time Early Warning System. The goal, uh, like many of the previous speakers described, is when you're trying to get machines to do something, you have to define an objective. And here, the goal for the machine is going to be trying to learn how to spot sepsis, okay? And so here's a little under the hood. What is the point of sepsis? What is the goal of uh, learning sepsis? So here in this particular case, all the way on top, what I have is time, and these stars denote when particular milestone events might happen. Really, but underlying it, what really is happening is changes in status are actually latent. All we get to see is when critical events are reached, but probably along the way, at some point, you started to get septic, you started to get worse and worse, and then we noticed it. What we'd like is a system that denotes these desired outputs, right? It notes when these change, uh, system state changes are happening and identifies them. And what we want to build is basically we're okay with a system that has the following uh, property. If it's um, below, it says negative, uh, positive, or nothing, which means, like Manuela spoke about, we want to build symbiotic systems, so we want them to be reliable. We want them to be safe. So here are places where it'll say, I don't know. So I know what is happening, I'm confident it's negative. I know what's happening, I'm confident it's positive, and I have no clue what's going on, and I wanna wait and watch to see what's going on. And later, we can take the system and grade it. So when it says it's confident and it's not, it's incorrect, we want to harshly penalize it. Now, in order to do this, it's effectively learning this from all the data that I just, from, we wanted to learn from the kinds of data that are there in the system. Now, here's how classically these techniques have worked. So classically, the way we learn these kinds of detectors are using sort of regression-based methods or machine learning. They're called supervised learning techniques where you have an objective function, which is to recreate a score. And effectively, what you do is you take your data, you extract a whole bunch of risk factors. You've seen this in many epidemiology studies, many um, um, medical studies, where we extract a whole bunch of it these features like the age and BMI and mean heart rate and so on and so forth, and from that we learn a score. Now the challenge here is we don't really know what is the score, like what is, we don't really have a notion of 
the latent severity, right? If we had a latent severity, maybe we could try to learn this function. Now, you might try to then create a surrogate measure that says, well, whether or not the event occurs within the 24-hour period is a good surrogate measure. And that would be probably, so that is sort of the reasonable approach people take. But the question is, is that enough? And where can we go with that? So we're going we're gonna to push the system quite a bit. And here are the three key ideas we're going to use. So the first, we have hundreds of these signals, OK? And really, we think of health and the human body as a low-dimensional system. You have your six organ systems or seven organ systems. They're all progressing. If, say, for instance, my kidney is afflicted, many of the measures related to the kidney function should similarly show that result, should show deterioration. So I want to automatically, with some human help, learn these, um, low, the, uncover this low dimensional structure. I want to be able to learn a model for these various high dimensional output signals I'm seeing. And in doing so, it's really important. Unlike many of the talks that previously sp uh, spoke about, one of the things that's very interesting and important here is quantifying uncertainty. And the reason in medicine quantifying uncertainty is important is because you want to be able to collaborate with the human and you want to be able to say uh, when you don't know what you don't know. So in this particular case, we're, we want not only to learn this low dimensional structure, we want to be able to learn when these measurements are reliable or not reliable. Now, in addition to that, we basically then take, so exploit structure and use this to predict compute an estimate of the event probability. So this is the hazard function, and we're computing a distribution over the hazard function that tells you within any given window what is the probability of this event occurring, OK? And then finally, we take this event estimates, event probability estimates, and combine that to optimize the user's objective. So what is the user's objective? They want to understand and recognize sepsis as early as possible but they don't want you to give them unreliable estimates. They would prefer for you not to be wrong. They're OK with you taking risks once in a while, and they would prefer for you to go early. And so effectively, we will put this all in a big computational objective, that the objective here is to do early warning while simultaneously estimating these kinds of reliable estimates that are used in order to be able to compute these event probabilities. Now, a little bit of related work, just to kind of give you a sense to ground this in stuff that other people have done. Now, there's really beautiful work in recent years in statistics where people have looked at this idea of event probability and longitudinal modeling data. Uh, and so the way they think about it is you have this data, we fit these smooth functions. So you take a time series, you fit a smooth function to it. Once you fit a smooth function to it, you're basically using features computed from the function to compute the hazard rate. Now, one of the big challenges is that existing approaches posit very, uh, you know, posit the structure of the function, but really we want to be able to learn the structure of the function, okay? Second, um, when you're looking at many, many functions right now, existing methods, these can easily be extended, but these existing methods use very strong parametric functions. It's not so obvious how to couple them across hundreds of signals because the form of the structure of dependency is completely non-obvious, and it's not something that humans, like Peter spoke about, we could write down systematically even if we wanted to. And then, Finally, computing these from data is really hard as soon as you go to these non-flexible, uh, to highly flexible non-parametric functions. So here is one example. So in this one example, what I'm showing you is I'll treat every output as a combination of latent functions. Effectively, YID is each uh, generated as an output uh, where FID is latent, and FID is constructed by taking a linear combination of low dimensional um, of a small number of functions sa sampled, each sample from a stochastic process, in this case, a Gaussian process. What this allows me to do is to uncover correlation structure naturally from the data across these kinds of signals and these noisy, sparse, irregularly sampled signals. Uh, in addition, it allows me to get these uncertainty estimates. But doing this, and, and uh, to tying it back to some of the earlier talks, you could imagine, instead of having a linear combination here, you can now start building these highly nonlinear combinations like the kind Rob spoke about. So now, computing these functions from data is really hard. This is one of the reasons why people have chosen, you know, existing methods really work with 10, 12, 15, 20 data points, but we need something that work, works with millions of data points. So in this case, there's been some recent work 
where essentially the idea is as follows with pictures. So here in this particular case, x's are all the data points. What I would love is a way to estimate this function along with the distribution around it at any point, right? That's basically my goal. The issue is this is uh, computationally very uh, hard in uh, computer science speak. It scales cubically in n and cubically in the number of signals. So it's intractable for all practical purposes. So now what we're going to do is instead approximate this function at key steps. But the places where to approximate is not something I determine. The objective function drives where the approximations take place and it automatically learns the approximate function. And so here in this particular case, let's imagine this is the function. These red dots are the points at which it chooses to approximate. Now, given those approximations, now I can learn, estimate the functions at any other location much more quickly. So what that then allows me to do is compute these kinds of estimates I said I needed efficiently and very fast. Um, finally, the third piece I mentioned was this notion of writing down a utility function. So in this case, we will write down a utility function that has to do with the cost of false negatives. What are they willing to tolerate? How much are they okay waiting? How important is earliness and the cost of false positives? And now the thing to note here is how does this tie back to the previous thing? Well, all these size that I'm showing you here are really quantities that come out of the previous model I just spoke about. So in reality, it's just one big joint objective where it's learning the correlation structure, estimating uh, the um, uh, signals at every point and the distribution over it, and uh, uh, using that to estimate event probabilities and then optimizing utility function. So let's move back to sepsis, which is where I started. So every hour delay in treatment has been shown to be uh, associated with seven to 8% increase in mortality for sepsis. So back in 2015, I showed this result that um, with my collaborators that using data from electronic health records, it is actually possible in, uh, to identify sepsis early. In fact, we showed that you can identify sepsis a median time of 24 hours prior to onset. In two thirds of the patients, the remarkable thing is it's possible to identify them um, prior to any organ dysfunction. Now, if you're a clinician, you might think that, you know, organ dysfunction is a really critical milestone because before your organs have started to fail, if you can rescue them, there's a good chance you will be able to prevent it altogether. And then finally, compared to state-of-the-art techniques um, for doing any sort of detection in sepsis, we showed there's a 60% increase in detection performance. Now, these are new results that are unpublished, uh, that are sort of very recent results that uh, we're still compiling. But in order to be able to make these systems ready to a point where we can deploy this, we need alerts that have very few false alerts. In other words, um, existing systems, uh, they don't do early detection, but even if you, we were to use some of the early systems that clinically come out, um, typical detection rates, true detection rates look like one in 15. So it's really bad. One in 15 is not a very usable system. Um, you, if we didn't do any uncertainty quantification, we are looking at a system that's about one in 10. And now we're getting to a place where we're about one in three, one in two, depending on the population. So this is really getting to a place where it's possible to deploy, and in fact, this is something that now Hopkins has funded an initial pilot to deploy and is going to go live um, within uh, one, of the big hospitals, uh, one of the big hospitals at Hopkins in the next month. In addition to being able to detect, another really exciting direction is to be able to use the same kind of messy data to estimate which individuals are likely to be responsive to treatment. So not only are we detecting, if we could now assess, because there's tremendous variability in response, some very much respond to fluids, others don't, we could very rapidly tell them, this person is likely to be rescued by giving fluids versus a different person might be able to better rescued by giving vasopressors. Again, there's really beautiful work here in this area where people have looked at the potential outcomes framework in order to be able to try to estimate from observational data sources these sorts of treatments effects. And in order to be able to make these work from messy, high dimensional, noisy electronic health records, we're gonna need newer ways to be able to do scalable estimation and scalable and reliable estimation. And here we've implemented new Bayesian inference techniques. Um, and so I spoke a lot about sepsis. Are these ideas all about sepsis? Are they unique to sepsis? Really what I covered was this idea of um, a utility function, 
high dimensional data, learning correlation structure in the organs uh, in the our human body displays as we deviate away from normalcy into disease, learning about how different ways we spiral into disease and how that then these early signs and symptoms can help us target and manage treatment. So really these ideas are not specific to sepsis. In fact, my own lab and in fact, Susan Murphy who's in the audience is doing really exceptional work in uh, some other really exciting areas using these types of techniques. Um, so I started my talk by talking about Mrs. Barbara Manny. Um, so we went and actually got Mrs. Barbara Manny's data and we ran this version of TRUES on Mrs. Barbara Manny's data. And here's what we found. TRUES would have identified Mrs. Barbara Manny's sepsis 12 hours earlier than we currently did. My clinician colleagues would say, in this case, this would have been the difference between life and death. So I think it's very exciting that using these kinds of techniques, there's now an opportunity that with the um, enormity of electronic health records data then being present, our ability to be able to potentially come up with new treatment, uh, new ways to do prevention uh, and treatment more effectively. And with that, thank you. In particular, I wanna thank my colleague, Peter Pronovos, Peter Green, and David Higa, and Nishri Rath, who are critical colleagues who are very instrumental in this work. And um, that's all. Question. Yeah, so, so that was a beautiful talk. So if you look at the types of data that go into making the prediction, can that inform what type of data we should actually be collecting? That is, as you say, there's a lot of messy data. Some of it must contribute a lot to the prediction, some not at all. Are there data types that if we had more frequent blood pressure measurement or some simple data type that was potentially easily implementable, you'd improve the prediction of your um, approach? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a beautiful question. And in fact, it's really, I love math and I love statistics because it just ties everything together so beautifully. So in this particular case, uh, you can think of it as optimizing the same objective. If, if our objective function, our, our goal was to improve reliability, if part of the decision making was their ability to take new measurements, then you could also learn when would be a good time to take new measurements so that you could reduce your uncertainty and improve reliability. Um, and that's something I definitely think is possible. Right now, one of the big challenges is interfacing, uh, you know, we need new science and how do we interface systems like this and practice with clinicians where we really can do what Manuela described as symbiotic AI, right? We can collaboratively work together to get stuff done. Is there another question for Suchi? I don't see one. Um, we have a little bit of time, but I think rather, rather than have general questions, let me ask the speakers to come up to the front here, and individually, if you have remaining questions, come forward and you can ask uh, any of the speakers that. So with that, let me, uh, let's thank all the speakers now and close the session.